hardest fault but mine Nobody's fault but mine And if I die and my soul be lost It's nobody's fault but mine I got a Bible I can read it for choose I got a Bible I can read if I choose So if I die and my soul be lost It's nobody's fault but mine God hath sent His Son Jesus has paid the price the Holy Ghost has entreated my soul, and it's nobody's fault but mine. Angels have watched over me night and day. Angels have watched over me. So if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. I got two knees and I can pray if I choose. I got two knees and I can bow if I choose. So if I die and my soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but yours and mine. Nobody's fault but yours and mine. And if we die and our souls be lost, it'll be nobody's fault. Nobody's fault. Nobody's fault but yours and It's a pleasure to be here in one of my favorite places in this beautiful church amongst God's people and my friends for Sabbath worship. There is a little service that I sometimes do for the congregation, and that is to tell them what time it is. Six minutes to one. If you get through listening before I get through talking, I want you to just wait on me, please. <laughs> the title of my message, Salt and Fire. And it seems appropriate that I should speak on this topic. And the reason is that at every meal in my house, a beautiful and caring wife or a lovely daughter will hassle me because I pick up a salt shaker. When I go to the General Conference dining room, it happens around the table. I travel with a quartet, and they won't give me any peace. Would you believe that this morning I met Dr. Faye Davis in the hall, and we hadn't talked a minute before she was decrying the evil of salt? I want to read a text for Dr. Davis and all the rest of you. In Job chapter 6 and verse 6, 
Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? <laughs> or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Verse 7, the things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. Now you know I'm being a little facetious. And I'm trying awfully hard to come into line. And I appreciate the loving concern of my friends. Salt is valuable. I have seen evaporation pools in Brazil and in the Isles of the Sea where they allow the seawater to flood in and then they dam it up and allow it to evaporate. And they pick up the thin white crust and they call it salt. But it doesn't taste like salt. It's bitter and gritty and often tasteless. I spent a little time at one of our health places and we had sea salt and no salt and imitation salt and salt substitute and all of it wasn't worth a hill of beans. I'm glad the Lord said in our scripture, salt is good. There are places even now where salt and soap are used as wages. Saline, salary, related work. That's why when you save a little bit, you say, I've got some salted away. And I am reminded as I say that, that I had a young man working with me once in evangelism, and frankly, folks, he wasn't worth his salt. In the Levitical ceremony... Recorded in Leviticus 3 and verse 13, God said, Every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. And in another place it says, With all thy offerings use salt. I had an experience when I was a child, and we didn't know any better. An experience that most of you have never had and never will have, and that is to work with my father in preparing pork and preserving it for the winter. We had salt tables, long tables with sideboards, and we used hundreds of pounds of salt. And we would take large slabs of meat and throw them up there, and then you had to rub and rub and rub the salt in. My father's instruction was, Son, don't miss any place and rub it in hard. There was a reason for this. We didn't have the giant freezers in those days that people have today, and if you were going to keep this stuff, it had to be preserved, and salt is a preservative. And if you miss a spot, then there would be a little worm. That would spoil the whole thing, and putrefaction would set in, and it had to be discarded. I would say today that the worm of indwelling sin is in every one of us. Indeed, it is pervasive in all the world. They didn't have freezers in the desert. And God commanded them to offer their offerings and burn them with fire. And often in the preparation, this flesh lay in the sun for a long time. So God said, with every one, salt. 
salt. But then did you hear from our scripture this morning where Jesus said, Everyone, meaning every one of us, shall be salted with fire. This refers to the mortification of lust and sin in every one of us. And God said, I will do it with fire. One writer said, salt represents grace and judgment. And in his great wisdom and love, and never forget its love, God allows fiery trials to come upon us. He is not sadistic. He does not despise us. Sin must be mortified. And I might as well tell you, this is not the fire that consumes. This is the fire that cauterizes, that seals the running sore. God said everyone must be salted with fire, and everyone shall be salted with salt. We have problems and we are born with them and they develop as we develop. The days of indulgence produce nights of pain and youth of profligacy turn into feeble and diseased old age. But more than that, the mind is set in stony bags. God must work hard to get it out. And so he said, there must be fire. For if sin is spared, the soul is lost. If sin lives, the sinner dies. And so the sinner, by the grace and dark providence of God, receives judgment by installment. And we sometimes are shattered through it all. But I want us to know today that this is prelusive a warning against judgment to follow. And if we can take it now, we can make it then. So everyone must be salted with fire. Sin is an inmate of the flesh. And make no mistake about it in spite of some of the things I'm hearing today. I believe and I have read that we're going to have it in us until the trumpet sounds and this mortal puts on immortality and this corruptible puts on incorruption. Now, since we can nullify it, then it must be mortified. And you don't do that in one service and with one shout. The Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Once, no, I die daily. The only thing to do with it every day is go to the cross with it. Let God crucify that thing. Every time a lust is awakened, every time uh, the flesh cries out, don't pamper that rascal. Crucify him. Now, if you ignore it and leave it alone, it will destroy you. It will prove mortal if it's not mortified. And the folk who handled flesh only applied salt to that which had a tendency to corruption. And it's in us, folks. There is in us inordinate greed. And some of us are so busy making it that we're failing. There is no success. Don't tell me about proliferated degrees, high position, or giant salaries. There is no success when Christ is left out of the equation. And Ellen White says... When we get too busy for prayer meeting and we don't take time to be holy, God will give us some time by removing some of our houses and lands and interests. Salt and fire. 
And then some of us are crippled by our own ambition. Now, the funny thing is, what we need in our lives is balance, and only the Holy Ghost knows just how much and just how little is right. So what Christ is appealing for is for us to be willing, and I'll read it in a moment, to turn ourselves over to Him. There's got to be a little balance. Without some ambition, we'll be like the fellow who aimed at nothing and hit it. But when it gets out of hand, there is a word somewhere that he that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he went on to say that every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And then our church today is being plagued with animal lust. We need a little salt. There are those who are afflicted with the vagrancy of the eye. Need a little salt in the eye. Some of us allow tempers yet to get out of hand. We are crying for salt and to be salted with fire. And I will tell you that salt is acrimonious. Salt will sting and salt will burn and salt will pierce, but it'll do good. When you get a sore throat, they tell you to use salt. And when you throw it in and gargle it around, it makes the throat burn. But it heals. It heals. In Romans 1, the Bible says that we should render our bodies living sacrifices unto God, which is our reasonable service. Now, under the law, they brought animals, but under the gospel, we're to bring ourselves. The animals had to have salt, and these bodies of ours have to have it too. Would you say amen out there? Under the old dispensation, when an animal was chosen for sacrifice, the Bible says it was to be separated from the rest of the flock. Here is sanctification in the Old Testament, you see. And when Jesus, the great antitype, the great substance of the shadow, made a final appearance at Jerusalem, the Bible says he went away, he retired to a private place and walked no more among the people. The animal was separated, our Savior was separated from the people. And when we render our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, there is to be a separation. And I will tell you, there's going to be one now or later. And this separation implies dedication to God. The great blessing and business of sanctification. We must make a covenant with Him by sacrifice as we offer these bodies. A covenant is an agreement between parties. We vow our vows unto the Lord in our hearts and then in church before God's congregation, we make our vows, and it is better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Where I go today amongst our people, I find men and women who seem to have forgotten what Seventh-day Adventism is, and they are contending with us who preach it. This truth has not changed. And things that should have been settled before the baptismal fountain should not become a problem today. We made a covenant! And let us remember it. We cannot make God long-suffering with sin, nor change its revolting nature. Now remove its awful smell from his nostrils. There is this shoddy attitude coming in amongst us with these little theological contentions that somehow today we have made a discovery that grace makes God more reconcilable to sin and to weakness. I say no! Then there are those who say that since Christ died for sin, we don't have to be troubled about it. I say no! 
The fact that he died indicates how ab- abhorrent it is to him. Now, one writer said the most obvious characteristic of salt is that it is essentially different from the medium into which it is put. That's profound when you stop and roll it around in your mouth. The most obvious general characteristic of salt is it is essentially different from the medium into which it is put. Ye are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. And salt that has lost its saltness is good for nothing. There is no known use for it. God has called us into this marvelous light and then declared, Ye are the salt of the earth. If you are the salt, then you got to be salty. And the essential difference is that salt is different than that into which it is mixed. Out then out of the corruption that is in the world through lust. Out of the moral degradation in the communities from whence we come, He calls us and then denominates us His salt and sends us back. And we are not worth a dime unless we are essentially different. I have chosen a simple message because I want to say to some of our folks here and there that God wants us to be special. He wants us to be different. Why are we breaking our necks to get back there and be like everybody else? Why, He wouldn't even need us if that's all we're going to amount to. God wants somebody who stands out like a sore thumb. That's what the term peculiar means. He wants us to be distinctive and distinguishable. God wants us to be essentially different. There is a text in the Bible that says that there was a difference amongst the people because of Him, meaning Jesus. And He makes a difference in the life, and then He makes a difference in us. And the difference is because... Of Him. And we are to carry this difference. Pervading culture around us. The television today is titillating. Salacious. Violent. Filthy. Sensual. This is the general fair. Now I... Never forget that breath of life is on there. I don't want you to forget it either. But all of a sudden, television is the social commentary. Insipid actors. Never touched by the grace of God, apparently. Are on television pontificating on complex world and moral issues. They're on their trying to settle theological problems, setting moral trends, judging God. And all of it is about as nauseating as an unsalted egg. Who are they to have their bastard children and then parade them on television to be ooed and awed over by a fawning public? These same ones sit in judgment of God and promote evolution. I saw one who took God to task with his finger pointed and he said, I do not believe. And if there is a God, he's doing a sorry job. That same man believes that we came from monkeys. And that man evolved from some lower life form and is on the ascendancy and that indeed mankind never fell. 
And these same actors and actresses whom we tend to adore deny the supernatural and at the same time fill the boob tube with horror stories, poltergeists, ghosts, hats, walking zombies. What kind of confusion is this? I, I heard something cute the other day. A creationist was debating an evolutionist on television. And he's one of the first I've heard on there who was getting the better of it. He made a comment. He said, a cloud is 100% water. A watermelon is 97% water. And according to the mind of the evolutionist, the only difference between a cloud and a watermelon is 3%. I, I thought that was cute, don't you? It tells us how absurd all of that junk is. Salt penetrates. You can put salt in a food and let it sit a while, and then salt goes all the way through it. Salt penetrates. I notice what people like to watch. All my children. General Hospital. The young and the restless. Dynasty in Dallas and Falcon Crest. And the point is, every day, this putrid fair and people are bound slavishly to look at it. And if you live the way those folk live, you'd go stone crazy in a week's time. God needs some salt. The fallen world is moral corruption. Left alone, it will degrade itself by degrees until it reaches the putrefaction of disillusion. God says, I need some salt. And if I don't have any, there is rottenness that calls down judgment. Look at Sodom. When he couldn't find a certain number, he pulled out the few that were there and destroyed it. Look at the antediluvians. When he got poor old Noah and his family in the ark, he destroyed it with the battering, shattering waters of the deluge. Look at the Amalekites over and over and over when a nation or a people lost all respect for God and there were no believers. Destruction followed. Ye are the salt of the earth. Believers here today, what a wonderful audience you are. How beautiful to look at. Ye are the salt of the earth. It is God's purpose that when we leave here, we'll go back into Mississippi and go back into North Florida and go all out through Alabama and all the other parts of this conference and wherever else we come from as agents to arrest decay in our own lives first, then in our homes, then in our communities, then in our churches, in our schools. We are to be the moral disinfectant for God. We are to nullify potential rot. We are the Lysol in the toilet bowl. God wants us today to be the salt of the earth. And in that same section of the scriptures, he said, You are a candle, a light. And no man lights a candle and puts a bushel over it. A special reference to Jerusalem. He said it's set on a hill, and Jerusalem was on Mount Moriah, a hill. But then Christ spoke, portending judgment, when he said, If the salt has lost its savor, there is great and appalling declension. The light on the hill goes out. Now look, the fact that it's on the hill means it is conspicuous. 
And when a light in a valley goes out, nobody notices. But when a light on a hill goes out, its conspicuousness heightens its shame. That's why when Jerusalem went up in flames, the heathen gathered on the mountains and cried, Ichabod, the glory is departed. Over in Maryland, unfortunately, a deacon of one of our churches fondled a little girl and was arrested. Now that's a tragedy, a tragedy for both families and for the church. But what I want to tell you is this, in the Washington Post, a newspaper read around the world, the article was headlined, Seventh-day Adventist Deacon Fondles Little Girls. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I was angered by that at first, but then I thought it through and I said, that's a compliment. You don't read that a Catholic deacon fondles a little girl. You don't read that a Baptist deacon fondles, and they do fondle them. But when a Seventh-day Adventist does it, that's big news. The world expects more of us than that. They can go to the movies, but you can They can attend these functions, but you can't. And when you do, you let them down. And when you show up with all that goo on your face, they might look at you and say, My, you look stunning, which means they have been stunned. There's a difference. You have been set on a hill, might not like you, but they respect you. And when you let down the standard, you have let them down. There are people who think if they can just be around Elder Mosley, they'll make it in. I understand that. When I sit with him and talk, I have the distinct impression that I'm in the presence of a holy man. Same with Earl Cleveland and Eric Ward and all my friends up here. When people are around you on the job, they might not be ready yet for commitment, but they keep saying, there's one here. I'm going to watch that one in one of these days. And then all of a sudden that one comes in. Fingers loaded. Little gold chain. And the light on the hill goes out. And the salt loses its savor. When Jesus said this first, he spoke to his disciples. He said, now look, you, you're mine. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the salt of the earth. Amongst them were the weak ones, the ambitious ones, the politicians who said, I want to sit on one side, my brother on the other. The ones who wondered who's going to be the greatest. And the Lord looked at that rotten, sorry bunch and said, Ye are the salt of the earth. That's kind of encouraging, isn't it? By the way, when he said that, Judas was still in. Lord told Judas, man, you still got an opportunity. You the salt of the earth. He was challenging Judas and his morality and his loyalty. You are the salt of the earth. Christ always sees the great side of humanity. He was looking beyond Pentecost. When the Holy Ghost would come down and fill these men, he saw them as they might become. He addresses that side, and he encourages us. In the church today, I know how you are, because I know how I am. You look around, and you think you've made some progress. Then you look at Jesus, and you say, i got a long way to go. And it's almost enough to discourage you, isn't it? Lord says, I know how far you got to go, but ye are the salt of the earth. 
just as you are. I'm glad Jesus is like that. Tell a man he's a fool and he will despair. Tell a fellow how worthless he is and he falls into despondency. Tell children they'll never amount to anything and they won't. You know, this is something we need to preach about a lot more. Jesus never gave a discouraging view of ourselves. Jesus believed in us even when we were yet sinners. I hadn't planned to mention this. I got a nephew sitting out here in front of me, and he was out yonder, y'all. The Lord laid his hands on him, and I baptized him last year. Oh, what a great change. And when we were riding down here, we were talking about what the Lord has done. And you know, I baptized his wife, and she's a wonderful girl. And he said to me, I was out there acting the fool and didn't even know that the Lord was looking out for me then. That's the way the Lord is. He always lifts, even when we're down on ourselves. When the church is through with you and the board is voting you out, Jesus says, I'll take you. Come on back. You are the salt of the earth. That's Jesus. Now, if you come haughty, he's going to blast you. But every contrite soul, he'll open up the kingdom for. Oh, fathers, today is Father's Day. Let me throw this in. We ought to be careful always to encourage our families. Old Dexter Manley. Most of y'all don't know who that is. Dexter Manley is a great big giant, weighs 255 plus pounds, defensive in extraordinary for the Washington Redskins, made a multimillionaire by playing the game of football. Two weeks ago, he sat before a congressional investigating committee on illiteracy, and there he wept out a confession that he went from the first grade through the university and could not read. And one of the congressmen was saying, Dexter, how did this happen? What went wrong? Dexter made it clear I was given to the outrageous gesture. I was trying to get attention. I was trying to feel important. Why, Dexter? Because from the first day I can remember, all I heard was, you're no good. You'll never amount to anything. The man had a learning disability. And here he was, a millionaire weighing 250-some pounds, going to school with sixth graders, but he knows how to read now. Got to do that. Don't tell a boy what a thug he is, even if he is. You know, children don't think, but tell them they are philosophers. They'll learn how to think. If your wife can't cook, tell her how good it is. Now, 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 don't lie, but find something good to say. I, one man said to me, my wife must think I'm a deity. She offers burnt offerings before me. <laughs> the point is, who can do his best when he's watched and suspected and criticized and de denigrated? Who can do his best? I'm glad that Jesus lifted me. Took me up off Market Street down in Greensboro, North Carolina. Never heard of Oakwood College. Grabbed me up and brought me down here and tried to make something out of me. My best friend spent 22 years in the penitentiary. Jesus saw some good. That's the way Jesus is. I want to tell you when a real bad sinner gets converted, he's got a witness the rest of us can't have. My nephew goes amongst his old drinking buddies now. First they laughed at him, tried to get him to drink. 
One of them said to him when he didn't want to miss service one night, Don't let your uncle make a fanatic out of you. My nephew said, You know, and this guy's supposed to be an Adventist. My nephew said, You know, you've known me for years. I was out there drinking and smoking and doing wrong, and never once did you give me any counsel. Now that I want to do right, Oh, the devil's a mess, ain't he? I tell people in my evangelistic campaigns, you can go out in the middle of the square and announce you're going to get drunk. Nobody will say anything. They will laugh and wave and wonder if they can go along with you. But the minute you decide to obey God, here they come. Everybody trying to give you some advice. But then after a while, these people notice a change. Got another le- nephew who's a lawyer. And he had been sort of making fun. And one day he, he got real solemn and he said, I can see a difference now. Salt. I, I can see that your skin is changed. Hey, y'all know that's something to that? This truth straightens out your skin. It combs your hair and brushes your teeth. This truth, this truth that we love will iron your shirt, press your pants, wash your face, clean your house. Salt is pungent. Light is lustrous. They are both active influences. And when you are salt, you don't have to keep a lot of noise. You know, the brain is silent. It's the tongue that flaps all the time. I went to a sixth grade commencement on the morning that I left to come down here. And the salutatorian, little boy about yay high, was giving a speech. It was a mighty speech. And he said that Einstein said if A is success, then A equals X plus Y plus Z. A being success equals X, which is hard work, Y, which is balanced recreation, and Z, which is keeping your mouth shut. I thought that was amazing. Brain doesn't make any noise. The sun is dumb. While the forests murmur, the ocean is boisterous, while the constellations are quiet, God said of Aaron, he speaks well, but it was Moses whose countenance lit up like lightning. The priests in Israel ran their mouths by the mile, but the Urim and the Thummim blazed out their instructions in silence. Salt doesn't have to keep a lot of noise, but if the salt has lost its savor, and the critics of Scripture wanted to catch Jesus with incorrect speech, simply because they had never seen salt without savor, they thought they had him. I have a salt shake, I shouldn't tell this. In my desk drawer. <laughs> now, now, I, I'll tell you, I haven't used it in so long, I forgot it was there. <laughs> Dr. Davis. And, but even then, you sprinkle it a little bit and it tastes just like it was brand new. So these critics and skeptics were trying to catch Jesus with inaccurate speech. But you see, he made salt. He knows more about it than we do, and even if that analogy doesn't fit, if it's invalid, he wasn't talking about salt anyhow. He's talking about men who lose their moral influence. He's talking about television evangelists who are disgraced before the public. And he's talking about the members of his church, about whom he said, many 
a star known for its brilliance, will go out in darkness and and I say, Lord, have mercy. Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Not hear you brag, but see your good works. And when they do, they will be constrained. To glorify your Father which is in heaven. And if this doesn't happen, the salt has lost its savor and is thenceforth. You can go too far. You can be irretrievable. You can go too far beyond the bounds of salvation. And it is thenceforth good for nothing. Let me come back quickly to a point. Salt does not irritate the whole skin You can take salt and rub it all over your body. It only burns where there's a sore. It only burns where there is a problem. It causes the patient to wince and to cry out sometimes. But a healthy person is not bothered by salt. A just person isn't bothered by the police. And a good old salty Adventist is not offended by the spirit of prophecy. The folk who are down on it are not up on it. A straight message never offends a good converted Christian. Would you say amen out there? I am rushing now. But they tell me the greatest peace is peace with the greatest. Faithfulness can disturb your peace, that is, your circumstances and surroundings. But there is a peace in the heart that passeth understanding. When I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, all of the stars and constellations of the heavens are just the porch lamps of the king's palace. They are the street lights of his heavenly way. But he is more glorified when a sinner is converted and is courageous enough to live up to his convictions than by gazing at constellations. We are the salt of the earth. A city set on a hill. Last night I had a first time experience. I couldn't sleep. And we turned on WOCG, I think that's what it's called. And oh my, see I'm listening usually to GTS. Where they play requiems and masses. Last night I heard music that edifies. And in the course of the evening somebody sang, God has always had a people. And I thought, yeah, the salt of the earth. God has always had a people. Men who can't be bought or sold. Women who are beyond purchase. God's got somebody here today. In spite of all that's going on around us, somebody here today wants to be faithful. Am I right? Somebody here today wants to do God's will. Somebody here today wants to make heaven his home. That same one, like the disciples when Jesus spoke, could say today, I have no power. He says to you, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in. All power is given unto me. I'll come in and bring power. Power to love this truth. And church, make no mistake about it. I've thought it through and I've concluded that the ability to believe this message is a gift from God. I'll bring power to live right. Power to overcome. 
Let me in and I'll give power to straighten up and power to shut up and power to be kind to your wife and walk be your, before your family as a, a good man. I'll give you power if you let me come in. And then I'll give you power in prayer so that you can move the arm of God on your knees. Oh yeah. If you've never had a prayer answered, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Ah, but ladies and gentlemen, over and over and over again, a human being with all of his weaknesses can drop on his knees and make the devil tremble and God will stir on his throne. A theologian went to the Valley of Salt near a little town called Aleppo. He wrote this down. He said, when I walked in the Valley of Salt, it crunched beneath my feet. It sounded like walking on frozen snow. He said, I reached down and I picked up some pieces. And he said, I tasted it. And it was absolutely tasteless. It had lain too long in the sun and in the rain. It had been trodden underfoot too long. And when I tasted it, This to which I had made my pilgrimage, this to which I had journeyed as a tourist, this to which I came to speculate, when I tasted it, it had lost its savor. And I began to wonder, why do they call it salt? But he said, as I stood there, certainly disappointed, I looked and saw a giant boulder, a rock in the desert. He said, I walked over to the rock to get into the shade, and I noticed that a crust of salt had formed around that rock. He said, I was standing there with nothing to do, musing over my disappointment. I took my foot and I kicked it and some of it broke off. And he said, I reached down and I got a little piece. And when I tasted it, it had its savor. It was salt. He concluded, therefore, that the salt that stays close to the rock never loses its savor. Never reproaches the church. Never loses courage. Never wants to give up. Close to the rock. Close to the rock. Mr. President, I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't some good people here right now. The salt of the earth were almost discouraged because they don't seem to make as much progress as they would like. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Oh, my Father, thank you for believing in us. Thank you for assuring us that we can make it somehow. When the storms of life are raging, we can make it. When temptation is tracking us like the Egyptians tracked the freed slaves of Israel, you can open up a way. Thank you, Lord, for assuring us that you believe in us, not because of what we are, but because of who Jesus is. Thank you, Lord, that weak and sinful though we be, if we'll just come close to the rock, you're able to make something out of us anyhow. 
You will lift us up out of the predatory pits of selfishness and sin, out of the miry clay, and plant our feet on a rock to stay. Thank you, Lord, that our success is not guaranteed by our determination, by the works of our hands, but by Jesus, His blood and His righteousness. Thank you, Lord, that you've led us to this church and that chapel across there for today. We're not here by accident. You arranged a rendezvous with the Holy Ghost here. And old Satan, the accuser of the brethren, highlights our faults and our weaknesses, makes us feel like giving up. Thank you for calling us in spite of that, the salt of the earth. And now, Lord, I wonder if there's somebody here that you want to move today. To bring on over close to the rock. To bring us over on your side. Yeah, we finish this prayer. We pause to invite that weak, trembling soul to stand up for Jesus and to stand in confidence knowing that He who begins a good work in us is able to finish it. We can make it, Lord. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and I know the hour is late, I wonder if there's someone here today who has felt washed out and flat out down spiritually. And the Lord has spoken to you this morning and you want to be His and to trust Him and to let Him make you what indeed you ought to be. If there is such, would you stand up now? Whether you're in the balcony or on this floor, Thank God for those who are standing, and we got to do more than that. Sister Johnson, let's invite them down here. Slip out of your seat and come right down here. Those who are standing, please. Don't let anything discourage you. Let's make heaven glad for a change. Just come on quickly now. This service won't last much longer, but this is more important than going to dinner. Pastor Kelly around, who's here? Just come down and let the ministers of the gospel take your hand and our Bible workers get your names. Is there someone else? If you're in that other auditorium, get up and come out and walk over here and take your stand for Jesus. Get close to the rock. Close to the rock. Some of you are backsliders. Come on home. You are ashamed of yourself, but Jesus is not ashamed of you. Come on home, backslider. Come on home. Open wide thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. Those who are not responding to this appeal, please keep still. Don't go moving around. Keep your seat. Just give us a moment here with a rock. Is there someone else now? If you're in the auditorium, get up and come quickly. Wherever you are, come quickly. Jesus is waiting for you. That's what camp meeting is all about. It is not strictly a social function, though it is social. It's an opportunity to make angels applaud. To dry the eyes of the Savior who maketh intercession for us. A chance to get right with God. God bless you who come. Our ministers and workers are there. Come. God bless you, young lady. I see you. Is there someone else now? These are the closing moments. I don't want to impose. 
but I'm an evangelist. And I got a burden for souls. Come now. Don't make us wait. Don't make Jesus wait. It'll never be easier than now. Come now. And don't let Satan sit there on your shoulder telling you how bad you are. We're all bad. We all have come short. God bless you who come. I see you. Our ministers are there to meet you. God bless you who come. Is there someone else? Someone else! Thank you, choir, for singing that softly. We wait just a moment now. If you're thinking about it, now is the best time. It'll never be easier than now. Is there someone else? Thank you, sister, for coming. On behalf of Jesus Christ and the heavenly host, I thank you who move. Is there someone else? Got a very close friend, amongst close friends up here. A man that I always love to hear pray. Elder Willis, I want you to come here. We need prayer this morning. We need to have the fires of lust quenched by the holy fire. We need to get our heads right. Get back in this church. Don't try to change it. If you think you got to change it, go start your own. This is the Lord's church. Is there someone else? Now I want to ask all of you who, like me, feel a desperate need of divine help today, raise your hand. Wave it before the Lord in sincerity. Pray for us, Pastor. Nothing in our hands we bring, only to the cross we cling. We have felt thy presence in our midst today. Our hearts have been convicted. Our desires for higher ground have been lifted. And so this day we have come offering ourselves anew to thee. These who have come forward in commitment of their life to the Lord Jesus. O oh God, seal their commitment. Hedge them about with angels that they might not be discouraged. But all of us, Lord, stand in the need of prayer. Some of us need to have ourselves encouraged. Some of us need to have our heads lifted up. Some of us need to have our tears wiped away. Some of us, Lord, just need to feel the press of thy hand, knowing that we can depend upon another's strength. Oh God, as we differ in faces, we differ in needs. There's a battle that's going on within our hearts. There's a fight every moment of every day, and only in the strength of the Lord can we know victory. We come confessing our sins and our shortcomings. We come acknowledging our helplessness, asking that Thou will empower us with power from on high. We thank Thee for Jesus, who on Calvary's hill paid the price, who canceled the debt, who brought us back from the far country to the Father's house. We are thankful that the doors of mercy are still open and so, Lord, today we ask that Thou wouldst take us by Thy grace and make us what we ought to be. Don't let this be just another fanfare, but, Lord, make this a moment alive with Thy power and with Thy glory. May we go from this place with minds made up to serve the Lord. And when Thou comest in the kingdom... We want to hear that word from your lip, well done, good and faithful servant. Complete, therefore, we pray, the miracle of grace in our lives. We will be wholly thine, for we ask it in thy name and for thy sake. 
Amen.